Good morning, everyone. How are y'all? Today's scripture reads from Psalm chapter 40, verses 1 through 11. I waited and waited and waited for God. At last he looked. Finally, he listened. He lifted me out of the ditch, pulled me from deep mud. He stood me up on a solid rock to make sure I wouldn't slip. He taught me how to sing the latest God song, a praise song to our God. More and more people are seeing this. They enter the mystery, abandoning themselves to God. Blessed are you who give yourselves over to God. Turn your backs on the world's sure thing. Ignore what the world worships. The world's a huge stockpile of God wonders and God thoughts. Nothing and no one comes close to you. I start talking about you, telling what I know, and quickly run out of words. Neither numbers nor words account for you. Doing something for you, bringing something to you, that's not what you're after. Being religious, acting pious, that's not what you're asking for. You've opened my ears so I can listen. So I answered, I'm coming. I read in your letter what you wrote about me, and I'm coming to the party you're throwing for me. That's when God's word entered my life, became part of my very being. I've preached you to the whole congregation. I've kept back nothing. God, you know that. I didn't keep the news of your ways a secret. Didn't keep it to myself. I told it all, how dependable you are, how thorough. I didn't hold back pieces of love and truth for myself alone. I told it all, let the congregation know the whole story. Now God, don't hold out on me. Don't hold back your passion, your love and truth in all things, I and mean, all that keeps me together. Thank you. Thank you, Kristen. I waited and waited and waited for God. At last he looked. Finally, he listened. How many people here are, uh, shall we say, patiently challenged? <laughs> Who's going to admit to being impatient? Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> well, of course, you know, in conversation, we'll gladly admit that somebody we live with is impatient, but it's not me. What are the things we wait for? We wait in traffic. We wait for things to get better. Or we wait in a waiting room. When we're in school, we wait for a class to be over, and then we can't wait to graduate, only to find ourselves going back to school at some point in our lives. We wait for love. And early in a relationship, we can't wait to be with that person to share every possible moment together. And then we can't wait for our kids to be potty trained. <laughs> and we can't wait for the Browns to finally win a game. <laughs> well, another game, yeah. Next year. <laughs> we wait for the preacher to get to the point. So many things try our patience. The family member that just won't listen to reason. The irritating coworker or neighbor. The person in front of you in line who's been there for five minutes and then remembers there's something else that they needed to get. <laughs> 
all those times when we could all use a pretty good dose of God. Now, how do we get that dose of God? Verse 6 is our clue. You've opened my ears so I can listen. The Hebrew for this open ear means literally ears that you have dug out for me. As if our ears are, our, our ears are jammed full of something. And only if or when we allow God to clean it all out that we can actually hear God. And there it is. Waiting for God. Waiting for God is not a passive activity. Waiting for God is actively listening for God's instructions. And unless it is music we enjoy, listening is not very high on most people's lists. This whole listening thing is hard, especially if you were a person who is accustomed to being on the move, engaged in you know, projects around the house or busy with the events of family life or enjoying the freedom of retirement. We turn this whole waiting for God thing around. Hey, God, will you do this thing for me, will you? I've been good all year. Even though the year's only two weeks old. <laughs> We'd rather the waiting for God thing didn't require too much of us. But what if Moses ignored God? How would his life have been different? How much longer would the people of Israel have been enslaved if he didn't confront Pharaoh? What if the American abolitionists hadn't looked at Scripture and said, no, God does not say slavery is okay? How much longer would the slave trade have endured in this nation so that an entire race of people could be subjugated to serve the wants of the wealthy? What if women all across this country sat around and said, you know, we're going to just wait for you men to do the right thing? How many people here would have the right to vote? What if Martin Luther King Jr. and Medgar Evers, and yes, John Lewis and Andrew Young, hadn't stood up for civil rights and spoke out against racism? What if there was no bus boycott or march on Selma? No lunch counter sit-ins. What would have changed in this country? Let's not fool ourselves that civil rights are safeguarded for all people of this nation. As we've seen in 2016, nothing could be further from the truth. While tomorrow was a federal holiday intended to honor the memory of the work of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., the true intention of the day gets obscured by some people who want to deify the man and others only want to demonize his actions outside of the civil rights movement. 
Dr. King's marital infidelities are well documented. And how he and his wife resolved that is, quite frankly, none of our business. What is our business is that the work of civil rights is not won and done. Dr. King wrote a very lengthy letter from the Birmingham jail. I'm just going to share with you a few portions of it. And I want you to listen for the civil rights that still cry out for justice. All you have to do is substitute a different word, a different cause. So I begin quoting. We know through painful experience that freedom is never voluntarily given by the oppressor. It must be demanded by the oppressed. For years now, I have heard the word wait. It rings in the ear of every Negro with piercing familiarity. This wait has almost always meant never. Oppressed people cannot remain oppressed forever. The yearning for freedom eventually manifests itself. And that is what has happened to the American Negro. Something within has reminded him of his birthright of freedom. And something without has reminded him that it can be gained. Was not Jesus an extremist for love? Love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Was not Amos an extremist for justice? Let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Was not Paul an extremist for the Christian gospel? I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. Was not Martin Luther an extremist? Here I stand, I cannot do otherwise, so help me God. And Abraham Lincoln, this nation cannot survive half slave and half free. And Thomas Jefferson, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. So the question is, not whether we will be extremists, but what kind of extremists will we be? Will we be extremists for hate? Or for love? Will we be extremists for the preservation of injustice? Or for the extension of justice? In that dramatic scene on Calvary's Hill, three men were crucified. We must never forget that all three were crucified for the same crime. The crime of extremism. Two were extremists for immorality and thus fell below their environment. The other, Jesus Christ, was an extremist for love, truth, and goodness, and thereby rose above his environment. Perhaps the South, the nation, and the world are in dire need of creative extremists. When I was a young boy, our family took a number of vacations to the South. I don't recall what year it was, but it was in the 60s, and I can't recall if it was before or after Dr. King's assassination. I was standing in a restaurant with my dad, And I noticed a black man standing off by himself near a doorway that we didn't come in. And I asked my dad why he was standing there. 
instead of with the rest of us people. And my dad said, because some people don't like Negroes, back when I was in the Army, he wouldn't have even been allowed in here. I recall how rude the cashier was to him. In a restaurant full of white people, this man was considered fortunate to be allowed to get takeout food for his family that was out in a parking lot. Somehow he was supposed to feel good about that. In the early 80s, I was at Camp Lejeune, and four of us went out for pizza. The hostess said, just three of you? No, all four of us, we're together. She took us to our table and gave us three menus. We insisted on a fourth. And she came back with three place settings. Again, we insisted on a fourth. And I, and I asked, I said, Sam, do you want us to leave? Nah, he said, it, it's, it's okay. The waitress came for our drink orders, and yet again, we had to insist that she take Sam's order. I couldn't believe it. I had never witnessed such overt racism before. And then I remembered being with my dad in that restaurant. 20 years and virtually nothing had changed. The word wait has been used to mean never. Scripture has been misused to oppress people who don't fit the majority view. I've never been denied a seat in a restaurant because of my race. I've never been denied a job because of my gender. I've never been denied housing because of my nationality. I've never been denied health care or salvation because of my sexual orientation. The denial that needs to end is our denial that there is even a civil rights problem in our country. And the way we deny Jesus when we say scripture applies differently to people based upon race, gender identity, sexual orientation, or any other way that we separate God's creation. Was not Jesus an extremist for love? Was not Amos an extremist for justice? Was not Paul an extremist for the gospel? What are you waiting for? Amen.